both fenced off demonstration areas to keep pro and anti death penalty protesters apart. And then in 1997, that change of timing, the state executed Robert Williams in mid-morning and fewer than 100 people showed up then. Right, and you and I covered those last three executions. Right. I remember the evening ones at midnight yeah. and a, very much a carnival atmosphere. Absolutely, no question about it. It's completely different, hopefully, is what they're saying today. Right, there are a handful of people right now to voice their opinions on this issue. We're covering both sides of the issue this morning. We begin with KETV Newswatch 7's David Earl. He's live with those who support capital punishment. David. Yeah, Rob and Julie, good morning to you. We are on the pro-death penalty side of the pens that they've set up outside of the state penitentiary here in Lincoln. I want to give you a scene set of what's going on right now as uh, we get closer to the time of Kerry Dean Moore's execution. Uh, right now, I can tell you, I count myself as among 10 members of the press who are here in this pen, along with three members of law enforcement, and we are the only ones here right now. No members of the public, no family members have shown up on this side of the area as uh, we get ready uh, for the execution today. So here's kind of what you're seeing right now. You see this orange fence tape uh, up along outside the state penitentiary. Those are cordoning off areas. On the far side, close to where you're seeing those live trucks right now, uh, that's the anti-death penalty side. So protesters who are against the death penalty will be assembling over in that area. In this middle ground in between, that's for law enforcement. State troopers and the Lancaster County sheriffs are in here. They're trying to keep these two groups separate and then where I'm standing right now, that is the proponents of the death penalty uh, who will gather here, presumably family members uh, of Carrie Dean Moore's victims. Although again, as of uh, the time right now, there's no one here who's gathered uh, to be to show their support for what's going to happen here at the state penitentiary in Lincoln today. You're seeing the state prison there, um, kind of eerie, uh, obviously, today with uh, this impending execution. And really, we're along Highway 2, Nebraska Highway 2 and 13th Street, uh, where there are so many people going about their day today here in the city of Lincoln. We've seen school buses go by, uh, bus transits going by, people in their cars going to work or wherever they're going this morning. So very much a normal day for the rest of Lincoln as we stand here outside the state penitentiary waiting for the execution of Kerry Dean Moore, the first in the uh, state in 21 years. You know, we spent some time with Maynard Helgeland's family members. He's one of Kerry Dean Moore's victims. Uh, we spent some time with uh, them yesterday and they talked about what this day means to them and uh, what, they're, what they're hoping will happen and what they're looking for as far as closure and all of that. Uh, that you would expect uh, from them. And we want to show you part of that interview right now. They become a footnote in every story. He murdered two Omaha cab drivers and they'll mention their name, but the details of those homicides and Mr. Moore's depravity in, in selecting those victims and choosing them based on their age. And, and if you read his own words, he thought about killing people for a long time. He bought a gun with the intent. His intent when buying that gun was to rob and kill Omaha cab drivers. And he killed two of them in five days. And if he hadn't been caught, I have to believe there would have been more. You know, we've waited 39 years for something to happen, and we've been through seven stays and a resentencing hearing, and we just wanted to make sure that the conclusion was the conclusion. So the family of Maynard Helgeland, you heard them there waiting more than 30 years for this day outside the state penitentiary in Lincoln, where we are live today. No family members here as of yet on this side of uh, the fences that are uh, pro death penalty today. Um, but we're going to stay here and bring you updates as we draw closer to that 10 o'clock hour. For now, live outside the state pen, David Earl, KETV News Watch 7. All right, thanks, David. On, on the other side of the fence, those opposed to the death penalty, KTV News Watch Evans, Camilla Ortiz with them. Camilla. Good morning, and as I'm sure David has mentioned, we're not far from where he's standing. So it seems like state troopers kind of have an area here between the corral set up for the um, 
proponents to the death penalty and the opponents to the death penalty. So this is the area where we're standing right here. But take a look. There's not very many people in here. So besides members of the media, there's probably at least a half dozen members of the media. There's nobody in here. There are for the there for the longest time. There was one opponent here. And I think recently in the last few minutes, another person uh, walked in here. So as as I'm sure it's been mentioned, lots of state troopers, lots of police really everywhere, making sure everyone's going to be safe here. But it's quiet. There's not very many people here. I do want to bring in uh, one of the opponents here. This is Matt Molly. He's with Nebraskans for alternatives to the death penalty. Matt, thank you so much for being here. Were you surprised to see? I mean, we didn't really know uh, what to expect. This is certainly a somber day, a somber event, and a uh, big step backwards for Nebraska. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there's definitely lots of Nebraskans who are outraged by what's happening this morning, um, re regardless of how many are here. And you were telling me earlier, I mean, as far as your organization goes, you, you were kind of encouraging people to show up to a rally later. Is that correct? Why is that? Yeah, we're going to have a rally at 5 o'clock later today at the Capitol. Um, we didn't want to have a chaotic atmosphere outside the prison, as has happened at executions in the past. I really don't think that helps anybody. Um, and so we kind of wanted to uh, minimize that as much as possible. So I'm OK with, with a quiet morning here. OK, and why are you here? Tell me a little bit more about what your organization stands for. What message do you want to send today? Well, uh, we've given up so much to get here as a state. We've wasted millions of taxpayer dollars. We've put these victims' families through almost four decades of pain and suffering. We've abandoned Nebraska's commitment to open and transparent government. Um, and to what end? Are any of us going to feel safer tomorrow? This is, uh, uh, it continues to be a broken program. It doesn't work. And Nebraskans prefer life without the possibility of parole. That's better policy in every way. And mentioning earlier, you mentioned that there's some financial implications. Talk to me about your stance on, on what makes the most financial sense for the state. Absolutely. A recent study uh, by a conservative economist at Creighton University showed that Nebraska's death penalty costs $14.6 million more than life without parole every year. So if you just multiply that by the 38 years that Carrie Dean Moore has been on death row, that's a whole lot of money that could have been much better spent on law enforcement, on victim services, or on property taxes. All right, Matt, well, thank you so much for joining us. So again, Matt and maybe one other person that is who is here right now representing the opponents to the death penalty, but we'll be sticking around, see if additional people will be showing up. For now, we will send it back to you. All right, Camilla, thanks. And never before has any state used the four drug cocktail, as it's being called, uh, Nebraska is planning to use to execute a prisoner anywhere in the country. And it may, Nebraska may never use it again. Corrections Director Scott Frake says no one will sell Nebraska the drugs needed for lethal injection. Right, and he says there's only enough for one execution. The sequence includes a powerful painkillers to knock him out and then a drug to paralyze more and then also another drug that will stop his heart. Now, the ACLU filed a motion Monday to stop Moore's execution, asking the state Supreme Court to intervene. And that motion lists Nebraska death row inmates as plaintiffs in this case. And with the past few days, two different drug makers filed last minute uh, appeals, arguing that their drugs are the ones being used in the execution and they do not support that decision. KETV Newswatch 7 Sarah Feely has the latest court filings in this case. German drug maker Fresenius Kabi initially filed the lawsuit August 7th, just one week before the execution. The company alleged at least two of the drugs to be used in Carrie Dean Moore's execution might be theirs. They asked Judge Richard Cup to issue a temporary restraining order. We'd like to prevent the state from using our drugs. August 10th, Judge Cup denied their request, saying there's no evidence its drugs will be used. The state has never revealed where its lethal injection drugs came from. Corrections Director Scott Frakes said the drugs are from a licensed pharmacist and have been chemically analyzed and verified. Fresenia says its customers, the medical community, are against the use of its drugs in capital punishment cases. It says that could cause them to lose business. But the judge disagreed, pitting Fresenius's own evidence against it, saying its many letters to Nebraska officials from 2013 on make it clear the company does not support its drugs being used for lethal injection.
Cup also saying Nebraskans support the death penalty and he will not let company matters stand in the way of the will of the people or the will of Carrie Dean Moore, who refuses to appeal his sentence further. The drug maker says it, like Fresenius Cobby, has sent several letters to state officials saying the drug company does not support its drugs being used in capital punishment, even asking for the drugs back. But it says it's being ignored like other drug makers. Monday morning, one day to the execution, the court ruled again in Nebraska's favor, denying Fresenius's efforts to delay the execution and stop its drugs from potentially being used. The state has 14 days to review Sandoz Inc.'s motion, which may not happen until after Moore's execution. In Lincoln, Sarah Feely, KETV News Watch 7. And we're learning more about a subpoena issued by Nebraska senators to Attorney General Doug Peterson. Le Legislative Judiciary Committee Chair Laura Epke says that the unicameral deserves to know about the execution protocol and how the state acquired the drugs destined to be used in an execution. Now, that subpoena aimed to answer those questions, but the Attorney General filed to quash that subpoena, and a district court judge sided with Peterson's argument last week. Senator Epke says the group will meet next week to consider an appeal. And again, this is the first time Nebraska will use lethal injection to execute a man. In the 90s, the state used the electric chair to carry out the executions. And 10 years ago, the Nebraska Supreme Court said electrocution was unconstitutionally cruel and unusual punishment. Judge William Connolly wrote this, condemned prisoners must not be tortured to death regardless of their crimes. The court said in its opinion, the evidence showed electrocution inflicted intense pain and agonizing suffering and said the means of execution was more befitting the laboratory of Baron Frankenstein. With that, Nebraska became the last state using electrocution as its sole means of execution, and the state was left with no means of carrying out the death penalty. Now, in many of Nebraska's most infamous murder cases, the details are still fresh, but Moore's date, uh, crimes date back decades. The family of Moore's two victims have been waiting 39 years for justice to be served. You heard a little bit from them. In 79, Moore killed two Omaha cab drivers over a period of five days. Rule Van S. Jr. and Maynard Helgerman. In Carrie Dean Moore's 1980 trial, prosecutors outlined how Moore targeted two men and carried out his plan to rob and kill them. His first victim, Rule Van S. Jr., August 22, 1979. From a payphone in the Smoke Pit restaurant, located then at 24th and Farnham, the 21-year-old Moore called for a cab. Van Ness arrived 15 minutes later, walked in, and asked for a fare named Bill. Moore and his 14-year-old brother Donald answered, got in the cab, and left. Moore would later tell investigators on the night before the murder, he called for several cabs and waited to see who would show up. He'd hide if the cab drivers were young. He told investigators he picked Van Ness because, quote, it was easier to shoot an older man rather than a younger one near his own age. In his confession, Moore said he plotted to have the cab driver go someplace where it's dark and quiet and there's not too much light, then shoot the guy. Van Ness drove the pair to Standing Bear Lake, where Moore shot him in the back, robbed him, and pushed him out of the cab. Rule Van Ness was 47, a Korean War veteran and yeah. father of 10. So Five days later, Moore struck again. This time, he entered Maynard Helgeland's cab at the downtown Omaha bus station. People in apartments near 22nd and Leavenworth reported hearing three gunshots during the night. At 7.30 a.m., someone found Helgeland slumped over in the front seat of his cab. He had been shot three times in the back of the head. Like Van Ness, Helgeland was 47, a Korean War vet. Helgeland was married with three children. All these years later, a box marked Death Row still holds evidence from the Moore investigation. The murder weapon is here, a 32 caliber automatic pistol. Now, Iowa State Troopers arrested Moore in a speeding stolen car two days after the Helgeland murder. Back with Omaha detectives, Moore confessed to the killing, saying he shot both cab drivers because he didn't want to be identified after he robbed them. And Moore said he kept the murder weapon because it gave him a feeling of power. At his sentencing, the defense argued Moore's life should be spared because of his low IQ and the beatings and abuse he suffered as a child at the hands of his father. Moore's mother and sisters also testify. Now, Moore himself rejected that defense, saying the murders were his responsibility, and the prosecution said the facts spoke for themselves, outweighing the mitigating circumstances presented by the defense. Moore was sentenced to death to the satisfaction of the family of Rule Van Ness. I feel like I've prayed long enough that this is what he would get. I really do. My prayers have been answered. 
and I prayed all along that they would catch him, and God answered my prayers, and that's all I have to say. Moore's original execution date, September 20th, 1980, nearly 38 years ago. So in those 38 years with, with uh, Moore on death row, he said he became a born-again Christian. In reports by the Lincoln Journal Star, he said that those close to Moore have said that he is remorseful for the murders. Now, Moore has two brothers. One is a twin who actually switched places with him in prison in 1984. David Moore was serving time for burglary. The escape attempt failed. A decade ago, we talked to David just days after the state Supreme Court stayed Kerry Dean's execution again. It's been Dean's wish to get it over with. I mean, he's tired after 27 years in prison. He believes he's found God, so he's ready mentally for it. Now, Moore's younger brother, Donald, was 14 years old at the time of the Van Ness murder. He went to prison for second-degree murder. Prosecutors said he helped his brother in the robbery and killing. He was not present at the Helgeland murder. Donald Moore was paroled in 94, 96, and 98. Each time he returned to prison for travel violations or drug use, his last parole was in 2008, and he lives in the Lincoln area. Yeah, now, Kerry D. Moore fired his court-appointed lawyer. He's asked that his execution be carried out. He doesn't want to fight it anymore. But in April, his case appeared again before the Nebraska Board of Pardons. And in a statement asking for his sentence to be commuted then, Moore noted that he'd been on death row for more than 37 years and the state had not been successful at carrying out his execution. Quoting Moore now, apparently they do not want to execute me even though I haven't filed any appeals for over 10 years. And Moore continued, therefore, since they are either lazy or incompetent to do their jobs, I should receive a full pardon. Well, the Board of Pardons rejected Moore's appeal. Well, coming up, we check in again with David and Camilla. They're monitoring demonstrators gathered here on the prison grounds today. And we're going to hear from two people with vastly different opinions on this issue. This is a special edition of KETV Newswatch 7 First News.